was a delay and we are live excellent good evening everybody and uh, welcome to our remarkable regional malts tasting uh with douglas lang this is jeff boss from starmore boss we're in our, our shop at 358 forward road up here in sheffield uh if you're joining us on the live stream tonight welcome if you are watching this on catch up hi um you're in for a, a a lovely evening as well um and we are joined by stuart which is that way, that way, always get it wrong, um, uh, from, from Douglas Lang, who is going to be taking us through uh, this amazing pack of the original uh, malts from Douglas Lang. So one, two, three, four, five amazing, incredible whiskies. We have a little tour of Scotland and the regionality, and Stuart's going to introduce us to Douglas Lang. We're going to have a little chat uh, and talk about all things whiskey along the way. So hi, Stuart. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hey Jeff, how's it going? I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I absolutely love doing these, so I'm ready to get started on a Friday night. <laughs> it's a good thing to to, to be doing, isn't it? <laughs> no, I so, think, yeah, you know what? It's funny. Like I do all these, I do these a lot, but everyone considers like you know, it's, it's his job. It's, I genuinely love doing these tastings, and especially <laughs> see if there's any questions throughout this. Please hammer them in. That's the the part I really love doing. It is get to drink whiskey and talk to like minded people. It's brilliant. Yeah. Fantastic. And if there any of the viewers, if you're watching live tonight, you can throw some uh, questions on the on the uh, comments on the chats, and we'll uh, we'll ask answer them as well. We'll bring them in as well. So yeah, any questions you've got, guys, just fire away, and we'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll see what we're doing. Right. What's in store for tonight, Jane, uh, Stuart? Sorry. Sorry, say again. What's it? What's in store for us tonight? <laughs> Where are we starting with? So as you said, it's a tour of Scotland. It's exactly what we're running. Um, mm -hmm. So it's part of our remarkable regional malts. And what we're going to do, we jump straight into our first whiskey, if that's okay with you. Always. Yeah. Yeah, going to break the eggs and all that jazz. Now, <laughs> for anyone that's drinking along just now or drinking along at home, what I'd recommend is that we're starting with the Epicurean. Then we're going to Timmer's Beastie, Scallywag, Rock Island, and then finishing with Big Pete. But what I do recommend is keeping a little bit of the Epicurean in your glass. If you've got one glass, you're going to have to finish everything you pour into it, so just be careful. But mm -hmm. if you've got two glasses, keep a little bit of the Epicurean in at least one of them. And the reason I'm asking you to do that, I'll explain in just a minute, but do keep a little bit of the Epicurean in throughout the whole tasting, and we're going to go back to it at the very end. Now, we're going to jump straight into the Epicurean, and I'll, I'll explain in just a minute why I'm asking you to keep a little bit in. But we're starting in the lowlands of Scotland. So for the Mark of Regional Malts, the idea is these are blended malts from each region of Scotland. So they only take single cask, single malts from each of the regions that I'm going to talk you through. So we're starting in the lowlands. Now, the distilleries that are in this, I can't necessarily talk about due to certain issues, but I think you could probably guess at what distilleries do go into this. I'm not going to say any more than that. It's around 90% bourbon cask aged and around 10% sherry cask aged because what the whole concept behind the remarkable region malts is to give you the traditional flavour profile of each region. Now, of course, we've got some wonderful whiskies like Balvenie Peak Week, um, which was released, what, two, three, four years ago now, actually? Um, maybe not one of the more release, release, recent releases, but Balvenie Peak Week isn't necessarily a classical Speyside flavour, but it's a wonderful whisky. And then you go to Isla, you've got unpeated Isla whiskies now, which isn't necessarily a classical Isla whisky. The, what we're doing with the Remarkable Region Malts is giving you that traditional flavour profile. So starting with the Epicurean. Epicurean is our lowland, single cast, single malts, only from the lowlands. Two words we use to describe this as fresh and citric. Mm. Now, we'll talk about the colour and everything in just a second, but the first thing in the notes for me is that kind of, it's funny, we talk about floral notes in the bottle, and that's a tasting note. We talk about floral notes. For me, I get a lot of herbal notes, because I always find Tasting subjective, it makes my job very easy. You get to, you know, anyone can just say what they want about it and you'll be right. If you taste something, you smell something, who's anyone else to say that you don't get it? For me, you get things like rosemary and thyme from it on the nose. It's really fresh and quite like grassy and a little bit minty as well, I get on, on there as well. Yeah, it has that herbaceous note mm. to it completely the whole way through. And the reason I'm going to ask you to keep it in is I don't know if anyone's been drinking cast strength whiskey all day. I've not. Uh, unfortunately, but not today. Not today. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> but what we're doing is these are all high strength whiskies. So minimum that we're going to be tasting is forty six percent, which is quite high. Now, unless you've been drinking cash strength whiskies all day, 
your nose, your palate's not going to be necessarily used to it. So what I'm going to ask you to do is keep a little bit in because I think everyone looks at the Epicurean and, and tastes it and immediately it's that ramp up of intensity of alcohol. But when we go back to this after Big Pete, and do remind me to come back to this, you'll mm -hmm. see how sweet it actually is once our palate has adjusted. But Slanch, cheers, happy Friday. Cheers. Mmm. Mmm. It's got a lovely texture to it as well. It's got um, uh, really almost like quite creamy, but also very fresh sort of style. It kind of rolls around the palate, which is really, really delicious. Like it's a very nice of, um, eardrop milk to it. Mm. The one thing I love, so the Epicurean, if anyone has met Fred Lane, who is our chairman, our owner, who's second generation, he promises he had nothing to do with the bottle design. <laughs> He's lying. That's Fred Lane. <laughs> it's just like him. Looks just like him. So wonderful moustache. And the Epicurean is our Glasgow man about town whom if manners hadn't existed, he would have invented them. Um, so that's the whole deal. He's a Glasgow gentleman. And the, actually the name Epicurean I absolutely love. It comes from Epicurus, who's a Greek philosopher, who firmly believed that regardless if you have a number of material items or only a few material items, it's what you take value out of that dictates how rich you actually are. So if you have a number of material items and take zero value out of it, you're a very poor person. If you have very few material items, but you take huge value out of them, you're a very rich person. So it's taking the value out of life that you want to. And I, I, I love that. And I think there's a lovely story in behind that. But this is 46.2% high strength, non-chill filtered, and no caramel coloring. And as you're seeing that texture, you look at the color of this and you maybe assume, let's see if you can get a white background here. You maybe assume it's gonna be very light and thin and it's absolutely not. There's a huge amount of texture to it. How are you getting on with that? It's lovely, really, really nice and, and fresh as well. Um, just the kind of thing that you need to uh, start the day. Breakfast whiskey, I would kind of call this. Um, exactly. uh, but um, yeah, you definitely get those layers of that herbaceous kind of element um, and quite sort of like stone fruits as well, which is really delicious. Um, yeah, and it's, um, it's the one thing we use this for is long serves. So, you know, like think something like a horse's neck with ginger ale, a little bit of Angostura bitters, long serves, nice and fresh and clean, very summertime whiskey or breakfast whiskey. I don't disagree with you at all there. Mm -hmm. completely agree. Make a great highball if you had some soda into there as well. It'd um, really, really Absolutely. clean out as well. But as we're sipping that, and as I said, if you can keep a little bit in, please do, because you'll we'll come back to it and show you. But it's kind of what we're talking about there, 46.2 and high strength and everything. Douglas Lane, we're a we're family run company. We have been since 1948. And that whole time we've been known as independent bottlers and blenders. So we've got our, I think I had one over my shoulder, it's over that shoulder now. We have our exceptional single casks with Premier Barrel, Provenance, Old Particular, and Extra Particular, if you're feeling exceptionally generous uh, over the weekend, which is all of our single cask bottlings. And then we've got our blends. So we've got our blended malts, and I'll explain exactly what we're drinking in just a second. But blended malts for our Epicurean, Timber Species, Scallywag, Rock Island, and Big Pete. These are remarkable regional malts. So we've been blending and creating these characters, let's say, for a long, long time. But in 2019, in November 2019, we took over Strathern Distillery in Perthshire and became distillers for the first time in 71 years, wow. which is a huge, huge accolade. And I know we're live and this is technically recorded so i have to be very careful we are building calutha and um, distillery which is going to be in glasgow um, and we've moved sites fairly recently we we're originally going to be down at the clyde side we're still going to be based in glasgow but we've moved sites and it's actually it's worked out to our advantage we're moving to a much larger site we'll be able to take about 60 percent of our stock there where the plan is to run three single malts and we're hoping i mean nothing's guaranteed in recent years, but we're hoping by September we'll have the first run of spirit from our stills, which is wow. really, really exciting for us as well. Congratulations. That's really, yeah. that's really exciting. And do you know what kind of sort of style of whiskey that you're going to be looking at from uh, those those two distilleries, those distilleries? Yeah, so the, the concept with Strathern is a lot of, we're doing a lot of experimental stuff with Strathern. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a small boutique distillery that we're running with, but we, we're doing a lot of experimental stuff, but we're also doing a kind of classic Highland style 
That's going to be the core of Strathern. And with Clutha, the idea is that we're going to do three styles a single knot. That's the concept. So we're looking at doing a lowland, a highland, and an isla peated run of New wow. Spirit. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I just can't wait to see this running and, and you know, start filling casks. And then in three years' time, we'll, we'll have uh, Scotch whiskey. It's going to be great. Great to wow. see. So uh, independent bottlers, blenders, and now distillers. It's a great yeah. journey from... Uh, uh, for for Douglas Lang, and it's uh, and you're saying it's still a family-owned company. So um, who who's in charge? You said Fred Fred Lang for our our uh, viewers tonight. Who who who's the the people involved in in the in the company? Yeah, so we started in 1948 by Fred Douglas Lang, hence the mm -hmm. name Douglas Lang, and then Fred Junior, who is our current chairman and owner. He is our our second generation, and then Carol Lang yep. is our director of yeah, that's him. <laughs> Carol Lang is our director of whiskey. Her husband, Chris Leggett, is our CEO. So we're in our third generation. But the great thing is, if anyone's heard of Keepers of the Quake, Cara and Chris were the first married couple to be initiated as Keepers of the Quake together, wow, which is quite <laughs> quite lovely. So their, their certificates, as well as Fred, sit in the sample room in, in Douglas House in Glasgow, and their their numbers are just one apart, which is quite nice. Um, but Cara and Chris are, are taking, they, they came in the company in 2013, and they're taking mm -hmm. a, a step forward while Fred is taking a, a step back from the company. So Car and Chris will be will taking the helm in, in recent years and, and moving it into, which is a huge turning point for the, for the company, you know, taking over distillery, building one and, and building our stocks with the 65 plus distilleries that we still work with to, to source our single casks. Mm -hmm. Wow, incredible. That's a, an amazing journey. And uh, yeah, it's going to be rosy for the future as well, just especially as, uh, uh, as whiskey in the last few years as well and the interesting independent bottlers that we found even in in the last like 12 to 18 months is really really increasing as yeah. people start their whiskey journey and they, they start with some of the bigger brands and then they get interested in like the okay what is the, the what is this thing about single casks and what are what are these other regionalities so it's it's a really interesting time to to be drinking whiskey and to be involved and especially with um, uh, uh, the work that you guys do with um, with the single cask range as, as, as well which is really really phenomenal and then yeah also these expressions of the of regionality of, of Scotland so would you say this is kind of like typical of a, like a lowland sort of style of whiskey there that lighter and fresher sort of style with a little bit of herbal yeah, absolutely. So it's, a, it's that traditional concept because obviously Mount Modern Day, we're seeing loads of different distilleries from different regions do really wonderful and unique things. And that's what's driving the whole Scotch whisky industry is this innovation concept. And the great thing about being with Douglas Lane is that we've got the traditional concept of whisky, which is exactly what we achieve with the Remarkable Region Malt. So yes, the Epicurean is a, a classical Lowland style whisky. But then we go off and do our weird and wonderful stuff that is Douglas <laughs> Lane. So for example, we've done our, our wood series with the Epicurean for I think the last two years now, I think a bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. But the, my favorite liquid, I think top five favorite liquids I think we've ever produced, including our uh, single cast range was our Epicurean Reef Salt, which you can see oh, wow. here. So this mm -hmm. was a, a limited edition, but Reef Salt being dessert wine casks. So we've done our, our full wood series with the Epicurean. So most recently we've released a Ruby Port and tawny port cask and specifically the ruby port was just like rum raisin ice cream it's, it's amazing because we talk about that fresh citric light style but they lend themselves so well to other casks that we decided to run this wood series i think we, i think we started the cognac cask i'm sure someone will correct me but we started the cognac cask we've done the the reef salt we've done ruby port tawny port um, and it just we've done a coat roti a wine cask as well and it just gives you that it's the same concept the same recipe for epicurean but we're just either finishing or aging these different casts and it just lends mm -hmm. itself beautifully so those right. traditional liquids and then you know willy wonka's whiskey factory <laughs> lovely stuff which is great to see that's yeah that must be that must be so much fun and exciting and to see all these different expressions and see how the wood uh that the the casks are, and the finishes really change the sort of like nature but when you've got like a, a really cracking whiskey to start off with like the epicurean yeah. that's that's going to be fantastic it takes on that that kind of characteristic while still retaining that dna that sort of structure of the whiskey to start yeah. with so fab really really fun <laughs> no it's great and you know what it's just for, for me I'm a, I'm a big whiskey geek i love i absolutely adore whiskey and to see these things come through and it's we're going to try this and you're like brilliant 
can't wait, can't wait for the samples to come through the <laughs> come through the office. Excellent. So where where are we on now? On next, so we've we've got we've started on on the on the lowlands, um, and I guess ge geographically lowlands because they are quite low and quite rolling kind of hills. And now where yeah. where are we moving to on our, our next tour of Scotland? So what's moving just across the invisible border that is the lowlands into the highlands. Um, yep. splitting Glengoyne's warehouse and distillery, if anyone knows that story, we're into Timorous Beastie. So Timorous Beastie is our Highland blended malt. So again, containing single cast, single malts. And I can tell you the distillers in this one. Glengoyne, Glengiri, Blair Athol, and Dalmore go into every single bottle of mm -hmm. Timorous Beastie. Now, the great thing about the Marcus of Malt is have a nose, have a taste. It's your whiskey. I can't tell you what to do with it if you've already finished and well done, happy Friday. But it's not entirely up to you. But with all of our whiskies, and especially Marco Rouge Malts, we do about 9,000 bottles to batch, roughly. Mm -hmm. and that's, that sounds like a lot, but when you consider that to a larger company, that's um, you know, it's a limited edition of one market. You know, our, our real focus is on, on, on the quality of the liquid, and there's a great story with Rock Island that I'll, if you remind me, I'll, I'll tell you uh, when we get to it. But Timorous Beastie, I've got, I've got my miniature as well. Mm -hmm. The great thing about this is you see this little cute little mouse in the front and everyone assumes it's going to be maybe, you know, very delicate, approachable. This is, it is approachable in a lot of ways, but it is a bold, fierce whiskey. It's timorous by name, not by nature. This is 46.8% high strength. Again, non-chill mm -hmm. filter, no caramel colouring. And if anyone has the opportunity to as well, pick up the previous whiskey, nose it back and forth if you've got that option and see the massive difference. Again, really light color. This is 100% bourbon cask age. There's no sherry going into it. It's 100% bourbon. But I think you'll agree, the I mean, I always like to encourage people to tell me their tasting notes, but the first thing for me is this wave of vanilla. And it's like creme anglaise, vanilla cream, oh, burnt sugar on it. That buttered pastry mm. concept, it's just, it, it's very deceiving in how light in color it is, but that's what I love about this fact that it's natural color from the cast and no caramel coloring has been added to any of the whiskies that you're tasting here. Yeah, I always think when you get caramel coloring added to whiskies, it's a little bit cheating, really. It seems to like mask the actual color. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I find that to be uh, uh, a little bit a little bit of a cheat, really. So it's nice always to see whiskies in their natural habitat without, without the need to actually add Coloring yeah. too, as well. I mean, you can all you can you can see why larger companies do do caramel color, but it's just always nice. I think from like a geek's point of view, I can walk into the sample room and go, "I think this is a fourteen-year-old in a second fill bourbon from this distillery, yeah. maybe," and and use my my limited knowledge to actually guess what liquid it is. And I think you know when you add caramel coloring, you kind of you, you blind yourself with that in a lot of ways. So it's just nice. And you know what, you can deceive yourself as well. If anyone's on a blind tasting, you'll you'll know something. I think this is one of those whiskies that you'll know it and go, that's going to be dark in colour. You know, it's just in your head, you think that's going to be dark in colour, and then you know, you look at it and you're like, it's really light. And the great thing I love about this is that, it, you know, Fred Lang always talked about when he was blending Highland single cast single malts is that they became really sticky. So when you do take this onto the palate, just focus how it sticks to your teeth. It's, it's really baffling. It's almost like, you know, honeycomb or crunchy bar just sticking to your teeth. Flange, cheers. Just. Mm. It's really chewy, and then the uh, the finish is really really long. You get this lovely, um, you get all that kind of like vanilla, the ways that come in, a little bit of like little apple kind of freshness in there to get a little bit of acidity. Yeah. We can talk about in the wine world, and then it's really as it finished off this really subtle spiciness as well, really which comes through right right at the end, and then just um, yeah, spiciness yeah. is absolutely right. Yeah, mm. and it's that kind of baking spice. You know, it's. I would even argue there's even like touches of aniseed in here, but it's that kind of cinnamon and nutmeg do come into it, but it's it's not hopefully intense, but it's a hundred percent there. And it's just delicate spice and I love it. But it's um Timber Species, of course, linked to Rabbi Burns. Mm -hmm. He's sleek at Kuru and Timorous Beastie. And it's a, a top of the hat to uh, the bard and kind of his wit and that juxtaposition of oh it's a cute little mouse. How intense is this whiskey? Um, and you know it's but I make uh, I make old fashions with this, orange bitter, orange bit of bitters, mm. bit of sugar. I 
think it works beautifully. And the great thing is the amount of times I've made old fashions for friends who are bartenders and it's it's like, oh, right, okay. And they look at it, it's like, this is made with bourbon. What is this? And they taste it. Like, how is that so, it's still textural. It's still, and the great thing about it, especially for making cocktails with it, is that it's 46.8%. So alcohol, and I'll, I'll get on to this in a sec, but alcohol carries flavor. So if you dilute from 46.8 as opposed to 40, when you're shaking or stirring, then you retain a huge amount of alcohol. Therefore, you're actually carrying that flavor through in the final cocktail as well. And it just, it works. It just works. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's great, isn't it? Really, really impressive. Um, and I can see it working really well with that, that orange and the bitter going in there for an old fashioned. Yeah. It'd make a really amazing. I've never, never thought of, of using it in that respect, but, um, yeah, that'd be perfect in, in, uh, in that cocktail. It'd be really delicious. And so, um, so the, uh, the malts that are used in here, so well, I'll go run through them. So there's Glen Goyne. Yep. Now more. Glengarry and Blair Athol, are they the, the four? Yeah. And always, uh, is it always those four core uh, distilleries or do you sometimes sneak some other ones in there as well? Or is it just mainly nope. those four? Those four will go into every single batch, but of course mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, it's no, not limited to those four. We'll always mm -hmm. include them um, and the rest of the Highlands, but those four are, we see as kind of structurally the ones that make up Timber Speastie. Yeah. And so they, they'll always go into every single batch, but we'll, uh, we'll play around with the other ones. Because, I mean, what we're trying to do at the end of every day, every 9,000 bottles a batch, roughly, is, is achieve timber speedsteak. And that's what makes a blender's job so difficult, is if you run out of one cask, it's, okay, how do we replace this? Because casks are different. So it's about achieving, you know, the most perfect timber speedsteak ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it makes, that's, that's why Scotch whiskey is an art form. You cannot, a computer will never be able to do this. You couldn't pass liquid through a computer and it'll say that's perfect timorous beastie. It'll only ever be done by humans. And I think it's one of the, one of the greatest overlooked art forms in the world. It is the, that's where blenders earn their money. It's the most difficult, one of the most difficult things to do. And also those, those whiskies that, that go in there, those single malts, like down, down was not a cheap whiskey. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> We, I think we're all very aware that it's definitely not. Yeah. So um, uh, I think uh, I think you know uh, with the, uh, the the fact that the value of, of, of these of these bottles on the shelves as well really really goes to show that you know uh, we're, um, you, you're getting a little bit of a bargain uh, for your for your for your book with with these whiskies as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's probably a good point to talk about blended malt probably at this point and what we're mm. actually thinking. You know, I, yeah. I, I get whiskey's deep and already got quite romantic about it being an art form, but it's mm -hmm. probably a good point to, to stop and, and actually acknowledge what we're drinking. So yeah. I, I get told this a long time ago, and I thought it was the, the best way to explain it, is that you've got five categories in Scotch whiskey, and, and I'm not going to get too technical. It's such a really simple way of explaining it. So the way that I've had it explained to me is that you've got two parents, it's my best bear impression, you've got two parents and three children, and that's your five categories. So if you think of the two parents, you've got one being single malt, one is single grain. Now the two words, single malt, single grain, single just means one distillery. So single malt, would be Talisker, Glen Goyne, Glen Givy, Blair Athol, that's one distillery. And malt means that it was made with barley. Single grain, your other parent is again, single, single distillery and grain is anything that's not barley. So more commonly wheat, but corn, rye, maize, all kind of encompass that. Now, single malts are technically blended. I'm waiting for the hate to come into the chat in just a second. But as long as you take all the casks that you're blending from one distillery, it still qualifies as single distillery and made from barley. So you can take a million casks from one distillery, blend them together, and it's still single malt whiskey. What we're talking about, of course, earlier was single casks, and that's individual casks from these distilleries. Now, underneath single malt, the first child, let's say, is blended malt. Now blended only ever means two or more. Now obviously more often than not more. We were talking about double barrel earlier which is just two casks which I think is a rarity or is a rarity. So it's blended malt so two or more distilleries and malt of course only barley is going into that. Blended grain on the other side. Blended two or more distilleries and only grain whiskies and of course in the middle which is the, the big fat kid that exists with <laughs> blended scotch. And that's where both parents come into it as opposed to the blended malt blend again, where it's only two of the same parent. So both parents go into blended scotch and that's where we find Johnny Walker, Chevis Regal, Ballantyne's uh, famous grouse, um, White Mackay. And that's mm -hmm. 
malt and grain blended together. So what makes blended malt, and that's what we're drinking this evening, is only single cask, single malt whiskies, is that you retain that malt flavor. But it just allows you to kind of be a kid in a candy shop and go, right, I want that cask from this distillery, this cask from this distillery, and then create something that is greater than some of its parts. And that's, that's what we're drinking this evening is blended malt. It's not single malt, it's not blended scotch, it's blended malt. It's a completely different category and offers a huge amount of unique flavors that, um, that we're going on to discover as well. So that's that's really exciting. Um, you know, I've been to uh, uh, quite a few distilleries and seen the process. And when, when you go to some single malt distilleries, you you realise like they that's the only one thing that they do. So you go to a distillery like, for instance, Lafroig, and all Lafroig does is produce Lafroig, and that's really great. But the, for them, as a as a whisky company, if they want to change anything, they can't really change much. They can play about with the barrels, but it's only that one thing that they make. So by blending different distilleries and different styles you have a huge array of options and flavors to really play with um so that's 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 got to be a good thing now we always find as a retailer sometimes the word blended puts people off but uh, yeah just to reiterate these are actually whiskies from single malt distilleries that have been put together uh and you know we have we experienced that i guess in tea teas are a blend of different items uh, and even when you're making cocktails, they're a blend of different ingredients that go into into each other. So, um, yeah, I don't think, you know, the word blend should put anybody off at, at all. Uh, I think what you are, what you get at the end of, of the process is a really exciting drink. And you should always judge the uh, the quality of the drink on its own and not really its own terms as well. But for, yeah. for the blenders, it must be so much fun and excitement that they have all these different casks and these different distilleries that are going to give them different characteristics. Um, I've been to, for, for this one. I've been to the Glen Goyne Distillery, and they distill very low and long and slow, which gives them yeah. a certain style. Um, and I've seen at, at Dalmore uh, the way they distill, which is quite sort of eccentric, and they get a, like a heavier sort of style of spirit. So you've got all these different flavour camps that you can then blend together to create uh, quite a harmonious job. And uh, just before we went live on on stream, me and Stuart were talking about the art of the blender, which maybe like talk about in, in, in a little bit and how tricky that actually is what a skill that that job actually is as well yeah absolutely but no you hit the nail on the head and it's just that you know when you mix spirit which is the same color as water that i always talk about is the dna of each of these distilleries so mm -hmm. dalmore has its own unique dna they produce a, a distillate and you mix spirit it's the exact same color as water but that's unique to dalmore so that's dalmore's dna and, and glenn goyne produced their own new mix spirit which is completely unique to them. So I always look at the new mix spirits, the DNA and the cask that you put it in is almost like the family member from that distillery. And I've mm -hmm. always loved that concept that, you know, you can put Glen Goyne's DNA into a sherry cask and that's your cousin. You put it into a port cask and that's your aunt and you mm -hmm. don't have to like them. You know, it's going to produce different <laughs> flavors, but you, you, you kind of, you have to love them, but you have to appreciate them. You know, it's, they're yes. still well-made whiskies. And you know, if you bring all of them into one room, that's still the Glen Goyne family. That's still the the Dalmore family, but it's it's that's what makes single malt so special. And then we took single cask. You know, that's one individual family member from that distillery that you're you're sampling. And as you were saying earlier, you know, it just increases your scope. So the further you go down those family members, you know, you go to single cask. That's one cask. Single malt increases all, uh, multiple casks just from one distillery. And then blended malt increases multiple distilleries, multiple casks. And then you go down to blended scotch not just multiple distilleries, multiple grains and multiple distilleries and multiple casts. So you, you, you nailed it in the head when you said earlier that it just increases your 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 palate, your paint palette is what you're increasing yeah. the further you go down. But the, the one thing with blended malt is that you retain that malt profile. You know, it's still that intense character filled profile of malt. And then blended scotch is obviously where you bring the, the sweet kind of tobacco sweetness grains and the malts together and it, it does change the character very drastically but you know it's subjective what, what mm -hmm. you like i might not like but that's the whole point that's what makes whiskey wonderful if there's one whiskey that everyone loved there'd be one whiskey on the shelf and that would be a very <laughs> horrible world to walk into much more than the malt still and there was just one whiskey in the shelf just go nuts like, the worst thing ever <laughs> And I always kind of think of like a, um, 
uh, a good analogy of like a, a single mole in, in like a band analogy is sometimes a bit like uh, a, like a drum solo or a solo that's that's being made by by one musician and then things like tomorrow's bc that we're we're drinking now um this is more like a jazz quartet it's those kind of like four distilleries kind of riffing off, off each other and when it comes to some of the uh, the bigger blends that's almost like an orchestra that you've got all these different parts uh creating this noise but if you get it wrong uh, it's going to sound really bad. And I sometimes think that with that analogy that um, if, you, if you're in a big orchestra and you have all those different like whiskeys there, one or two can maybe be playing and maybe hide. But if you're blending maybe like four different elements um, and like the jazz band concept and you've got the drums and the bass and then the, the uh, guitar and a, a trumpet, if one of that element is out, you're going to notice it's going to stand out. And especially yeah. if you're making only 9,000 bottles of this, you can't muck it up. You can't get that. You can't play a bad note. So I think it goes down to the skill of the blenders uh, and the actual quality of the, the whiskies that you're starting with in order to make a product that is really harmonious and structured um, and really balanced as well. So um, hats hats off, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's 100%. A, you, you've just uh, rhymed off Chris Leggett, our CEO's favourite analogy, which is, you know, a, a single a single malt's a, you know, a single instrument and a Mm -hmm. also an orchestra so i'm so glad you hit that point because i don't have to say it now <laughs> <laughs> it's an, an analogy I, I i really like to use and any kind of like, it works it works <laughs> yeah it does it really it really does wow so um that's tomorrow's beastie from from the the highlands uh and yeah really sort of vanillas and honey and spice on there um so yeah i've still got a little bit of the uh, epicurean yeah really keep, like, keep that in going back to that one and you can really taste that and smell the uh, the aromas of that um uh all, all the herbs on there that, that, that garig sort of style of herbs um so where's next on our, our little journey uh through through the tour of scotland where we're going after we're going further up northeast to uh mm -hmm. well one of the most iconic whiskey making regions in the world is yep. space Light. So we're moving to Speyside, which is Scallywag. So Speyside obviously contains the largest concentration of distilleries in Scotland. A huge number. I think it's still, I mean, we've got so many micro distilleries opening up nowadays, but I think it's what, plus 70% or still, mm -hmm. some, it's a crazy number. Some More than 70% or something exists in, uh, in Speyside. And we're moving into Scallywag. So Scallywag is our Speyside blended malt. So containing only single cask, single malts from Speyside. Most notably, McAllen, Mortlach, and Glenrothes going into every single batch of Scallywag. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing to notice, I've a uh, little bottle here. I don't know if you can see the Scallywag's missing a tooth on the bottle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Just about this, oh sorry, Scallywag was, operative word, was a real dog. This was Binks. So mm -hmm. we've had a long line of fox terriers in the Douglas Ling family. So currently we've got Cooper, who's lovely. He likes to keep, he's a wee bit grumpy. He likes to keep himself to self, but he's a very <laughs> friendly dog. But this was Binks. So Binks was the inspiration. It was actually, I think it was during a, a Big Pete Limited edition that Fred and I think Karen and Chris were discussing. And uh, the artist who designed the label for Big Pete was designing the label for Limited Edition was sketching Scallywag or Binks as, as uh, she was sat up next to Fred. And showed the design and Fred fell in love with it and then right we're gonna we're gonna do a bottling because the original concept behind the Mark original malts is that we were just gonna do an Isla blended malt that was it we were gonna do Big Pete it started in 2009 mm -hmm. and as soon as I think Fred saw Scallywag like, that was the inspiration to do a space side blended malt and then Timmer Beastie Highland and it just kind of it snowballed from there but the one thing you'll probably notice with the color of this is that it's darker it's really like golden isn't it much darker again natural color no caramel coloring so this is mm -hmm. roughly 75 to 80 percent again depends batch to batch and trying to achieve that that specific flavor profile of scallywag is roughly 75 to 80 oloroso sherry cask and then roughly 20 to 25 uh bourbon bourbon cask now this was originally planned to be 100 percent uh, sherry cask but we decided that, that wasn't necessarily truly representative of space side as a whole Mm -hmm. So we went for that kind of 75, 80, 20, uh, 20, 25 split. The one thing I'm going to, I don't, Jeff, have you got any water next to you? Uh, a little bit. Don't worry if you don't, don't worry if you don't, I'll, I'm, I'm going to, it's for everyone. 
uh, to do. It's the, it's the one thing where a lot of people ask me about the effect of water and whiskey. So this comes in at 46%, and we'll do it in just a second, but we'll, we'll do a nosing and tasting before I add any water to it. The two words we used to describe this as fruity and spiced. Um, and I think it's very apparent on the nose that how you said stone fruits earlier on. For this, me, this is like stewed stone fruits. It's just melting them a bit more and letting those vapors come off. Really kind of Christmas cakey kind of notes, like like plums and raisins. I'm actually glad you said Christmas cake. It's that dry, for me, it's the dried Christmas cake in a bowl ingredients. And then when we add water, you'll really see it turn into wet, gooey, out the oven Christmas cake. There's like, so I always talk about honey and timber species. This is that kind of rose blossom honey that you've, you you can always kind of smell. It's got a bit more richness to it. There's almost a maple syrup note to it. There's orange pith. There's um, orange peel to it. That's nice sweet bitterness. And underneath it is like dried chocolate, like dry milk chocolate. But for those of you tasting along, if you have a bit of water, please give it a try. And, you know, maybe don't pour the whole thing in or if you don't want to add water, it's, it's, it's your whiskey. You do whatever the hell you want with it. It's your whiskey. But what the reason I'm going to ask you to add water just to try it is don't do it just yet. And I know it's been recorded. Some people are going to want to ask for it and they're just going to throw it in. But don't do it just yet. We're going to add a little bit of water and then just cover up the glass. And the reason we're going to do that is to trap what's happening. It'll, it, not, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to explode. It's not going <laughs> to start bubbling. But what happens is, especially when we do high alcohol content, and I'll get on to why we do do that. I think I've been saying that for the past three whiskeys, but I'll get on to why we do that in a second. But when we add water, the alcohol and water react. So the first thing that's going to happen is an exothermic reaction. So it's actually going to raise the temperature by one or two degrees. So that's what we're trapping for, as well as congeners or congeners, tomato, tomato, pop off, and all the flavor is going to get there. But whenever we take on whiskey in the palate, we always talk about how it kind of opens up. You know, it's just all that pop of flavor. That's because it's hitting your saliva and it's reacting there. So what we're doing is just replicating what's happening on our palate in the glass with a little bit of water. So if you do have a little bit of water, just add it. You don't have to add a huge amount. And then just put your hand over it and just give it a decent wee swirl. And keep your hand over while, I'm, while we're chatting just now, in just 15 seconds. And what I want you to notice when you go back to it, just you'll know, bring it up slowly and lift your hand slowly just in a second, and you'll bring your nose to it and you'll actually feel a little bit of humidity. And just as you were saying, Jeff, that for me it's dried Christmas cake ingredients in the bowl and then it just goes into fresh out the oven, cooked, baked Christmas cake. It just It's the same, the same whiskey, the same profile, but just amplified, just, you know, baked, basically. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. So when you're ready, just... Delicately take your hand over it and bring it to your nose. Oh, wow, well, yeah. There's that humidity. And I, I, scallywags, the reason I do it with scallywag is because sherry cask has a lot more complications to it. And complications is just a term in terms of there's, there's more there's more pieces to the puzzle with it, let's say. So it's, it's a really good one for that. Um, and if you're using a, a wider glass, you might not have got it as much, but using a Glen Cairn or a you know flute, a champagne flute, which I've... I've had to use in a couple of tastings after I smash glasses. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll really see that difference. But all of a sudden you go back to it and it's melted chocolate. It's, you know, baked Christmas cake. How was that for you? It really becomes a lot richer and uh, and those flavours become a lot more more pronounced as well. And yeah, definitely those, that, that, that yeah, that, that warm, uh, again, a little bit of sort of spice, but very, very sort of fruity. A little bit like dried apricot and, yeah, a few yeah. of those red berries. But, yeah, they become, a, with a, just a touch of water, it just really lifts it. Uh, and, yeah, that chocolate note that you get on the back right at the very end yeah. really, really becomes apparent as well. If there's any if there's any questions about Douglas Lane or casks or anything that you want to ask about remarkable regional malts or independent bottlers or how I've been handling lockdown, you ask away. Like please, if there's anything you want to ask me, please just give me a shout. It's um so I use I make a boulevardier with this. So uh instead of a Negroni, you replace the gin in Negroni with this. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
requires sweet vermouth, Campari, this stirred down orange, and it's I absolutely adore it. So we we are kind of our perfect serve with this is a Manhattan, a chocolate, sorry, a chocolate Manhattan, um, mm. which is great. It, it, I've got uh, chocolate bitters that I bought specifically for it, and it works beautifully. But my favorite, my personal favorite drink with Scallywag uh, cocktail is a Boulevardi, which is Scallywag, equal parts Scallywag, Campari, sweet vermouth, stirred down on ice, mm -hmm. orange peel, and I think it's I think it's absolutely delicious. Mm. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that working really, really well as well. It's because it's got that lovely velvety kind of rich texture going on with it as well. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, having that little uh, bit with the bitters of with the Campari. Yeah, and the sweet vermouth just to prop it back up again. It's going to be delicious. It's going to be really, really tasty. Yeah, I think I'm actually going to have one of those tonight because uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think I forgot to pick up beer today. Uh, <laughs> so I've got Campari and sweet vermouth. What does that say about my bar? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but um, as you're talking about texture, I think it's saying um, before I forget or, or before I, I, I miss it again, is the kind of ethos of Douglas Ling and what we stand by and what we what we're very proud to represent is that we represent as natural as it gets. Now that's a fairly loose term, but what I mean by that is the kind of three pillars of that is non-chill filtration, no caramel colouring, and high or natural cask strength. So to kind of start from the beginning there, non-chill filtration, a lot of people ask me what that actually is. So this is, uh, in fact, there's any Americans watching, this was this was your fault, and I'm only joking, but it was, America's always been a huge value market. Um, right the way back to, to the 1800s, there's always been a value market for Scotch whiskey, there's no denying it. And when we started exporting Scotch whiskey, we were sending over to the American market and they were saying, why is my whiskey becoming cloudy when I add water or ice? And the reason it was becoming cloudy is that within casks, you've got naturally occurring fatty acids, proteins, enzymes that occur in a cask. So when we were bottling it, we were allowing them through and then we sent it over to America. But of course, it's the same concept when you add water to a pan, it's got a bit of oil in it, it becomes cloudy. It's the same kind of concept, obviously, very, that's a very rudimentary example. But it was the same kind of concept. So we're sending over and like, why? Why is it becoming cloudy? There's nothing wrong with the whiskey. It just became cloudy because these were reacting with the water. So what we started doing and what was introduced in the Scotch whiskey industry is chill filtration. So we always have to filter because we don't want anyone getting a splinter with wood chips passing through from the cast to the bottle. So we chilled that process down. So we effectively not froze it, but chilled it to a point where those fatty acids, enzymes and, pro and proteins became solid and get trapped in the filtration process. So what you ended out on the other side was liquid or whiskey that did not contain any fatty acids, any proteins and enzymes. But now what we're seeing now, especially in the, in the whiskey industry trends, is that non-chill filtration. So what we're, what we're only doing is allowing those fatty acids, allowing those proteins, those enzymes through into the final product. Now, this is still debated in the industry, but in my humble opinion, my opinion, um, if you allow those fatty acids proteins into the final whiskey, 100% affects texture. And whether that directly or indirectly affects flavor, I firmly believe that it does, it definitely does, in my opinion. Um, so that's non-chill filtration. We do not chill filter. We allow all those lovely fatty acids and proteins into the final whiskey. Um, high strength or cast strength. Oh, sorry, did you, have, did you have a question there? Oh, I was going to say, if you're, I mean, it stands to reason that if you're taking something out of the whiskey, uh, and if you're chill filtering it and then you've, you've literally taken something out that is going to affect the, 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 the texture uh, of it or the flavor in some, some shape or form, um, kind of stands to reason. So having those things back in, um, if the only problem is, is that it might make your whiskey go look a bit cloudy. I mean, people have seen that with olive oil on the shelf and your olive oil goes cloudy. Yeah. You just shake it, you just warm it up. It's absolutely fine. Um, but if it's if it's affecting the the actual texture, then that also affects the actual the way that the the alcohol is delivered on onto the palate as well. So um, I think even even if it there's an ex, uh, somebody could say, well, it doesn't really affect the flavour. I think the delivery of that flavour will be affected by by the texture of it. So um, it's nice to have them back in. I think. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, going back to the Epicurean, the Timber Species, you, you've got this concept in your head, oh, it's, it's a light whiskey, it's going to be thin. And it's not. You know, we, we've just shown that. It's really textural. And, and I would argue that's because we're allowing, you know, those naturally occurring oils and acids and whatever we're talking about through into the final product. So that, that's absolutely it. So that, that's one pillar 
mm-hmm. this is natural as it gets, you know, not nothing taken away, nothing added. And we've got high or natural cash strength. So all the whiskies that you're tasting are high strength. So they've been controlled down to the specific strengths that we've got in front of you. Now, Dave Broom did a brilliant piece on how 46, 48% is probably optimum. Now, perfumes aftershaves, they're based in alcohol because they carry flavor, they carry nose, they carry scent beautifully. That's the whole point. Alcohol does carry it. Now, of course, we don't want to go overboard, and Dave Broom talked about this. 46, 48% is around the sweet spot for most whiskies that will carry flavor beautifully without overpowering an ethanol. Now, that's not to say you can get, especially green whiskies, you can push up to 60%. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like a lot, but you actually can push up to 60% and they're still very palatable. It's really tasty, but that's at the blender's, the bottler's discretion to, to make that, that choice. But 46% it carries flavor. Now, the happy bonus to this is that you can bring the temperature down to such an extent and add water. You've probably seen this with Scallywag, but it still stays clear. And that's because 46% is generally found to be the threshold, but there's there's many different variations to that. 46, 48% allows you to add water, add ice, and it won't become cloudy. It's not the reason that we do it, but it's a happy aesthetic, I guess. Mm. And then the other thing is, uh, we've talked touched on it earlier, is no caramel colour. So all the whiskies that you have in front of you took the colour that they have from the cask and nothing else. That's the natural colour of the average age, and all of them about seven to eight years old. That's the natural colour of whiskies that age. And it's amazing to see when we've got the sample room is you can get to 21 year olds, you know, refill hogsheads and they're just as light as, as this rock island. Um, and it just get, goes to show it's that true representation of Scotch whiskey, which I, 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 I love to see, you know, mm-hmm. whiskey thinking me loves to see. Excellent. <laughs> So, um, so that's the Scallywag, which is um, uh, a representation of Speyside with the greatest concentration of, of distilleries there. Um, and I guess the, the characteristics of Speyside, again, as you go up from the highlands and you go back down into like the quiet fertile plains and, and you have a, a lot of barley growing there as well, quite rich and quite lush. Um, yeah. Hence, I guess, why there's there's so many distilleries. You've got like water, you've got the raw, raw, raw ingredients um, and that kind of characterise that kind of more mellow sort of style, uh, perhaps matching the, the environment as well a little a little bit as well. Um, yeah, it, really far away from the tax man as well. So it was, you know, hidden away in the hidden away <laughs> in the valleys was nice and easy to keep away and pick up your <laughs> still and move on. So, um, uh, so that's that's Scallywag, um, and where where to next on our little uh, our little tour? Where where are we off to now? So we're, I mean, you could argue that we're heading north or we're heading west, and we're heading to the islands of Scotland. Mm-hmm. So the islands are not recognised as a whisky making region by the the SWA, but I'd like to think that most people would agree that the islands have a very unique flavour profile, whether it's Jura, whether it's Iron, whether it's Talisker, or whatever it may be. So we're moving on to Rock Island. Now, I do not want to sway anyone before tasting it, but Rock Island is probably my favourite. Um, everyone's an individual. Everyone has their own taste, but I think Rock Island is personally my favourite. It just I, I love the flavour profile. It suits my palate. So Rock Island, I cannot tell you the distilleries, but I have a nice easy riddle, which is pretty easy to figure out. So we do incorporate Isla in Rock Island. There are Isla distilleries in it. We incorporate a distillery in the Isle of Jura. Probably guess probably which one, considering there's only one. There's only one. I think there's <laughs> only one. No, I'm not saying the name of it, but mm-hmm. on the Isle of Jura we, we do contain the, the casks from <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we take from a distillery in the Isle of Arran. There's only one big enough to supply us. This is a lovely salty note. So we do take from a distillery in Orkney. But I can't remember the last time that Scapa produced a salty whiskey. So you could probably guess which distillery we take from on Orkney. So I've not said anything. You saw, you heard, I've not said anything. This is recorded, it's fine. So those are the, the distilleries that we take from, or the, mm-hmm. I guess. But we talk about this being maritime and smoky. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a very low PPM, I would argue, but once we take this into the palate, you'll see this bed of smoke. On the nose, it has, it just has this lovely wave-soaked rocks, delicate salty seaweed that's not huge in the nose. And there's this kind of lemon sweetness I find on the nose. But, you know, that it's subjective. That's my opinion, my tasting notes. What are you getting from it, Jeff, immediately? 
it's it's all it's almost you know maybe it's uh, also suggested but it's very maritime you get that kind no. of i can close my eyes and i could be on on the beach in in um uh, west scotland with the with the waves crashing in you do get that maritime sort of saltiness that iodine that little ozone kind of element that comes out um perhaps a little bit of pepper on there as well a little spicy yeah. pepper note because um, it's not i would agree i completely agree with the pepper note it's not spice it's pepper quite mm. strong. Or, or maybe like coriander it's that peppery note in the nose but i i, I think the one thing i love about this is the the breadth of flavour in it and the, the change that happens with it. And we'll, and we'll see an element of this in Big Pete as well, but it just goes from the nose, as we've talked about, that kind of wave salt rocks, very clean oceanic air. And mm. then we take it onto the palate and the saltiness for me comes through immediately and then it just freshens up into lemon citrus, even that touch of seaweed uh, saltiness again. Lunch. Cheers, everyone. Mm. I can't go, since you said pepper, I can't get over, and, and it's great, I can't get over that kind of white pepper, peppery note as well on it. it definitely comes in the middle of the palate. Um, yep. You get that little salty element again, um, but it's still really fresh, and it's, even though it's it's quite a big whiskey um, in terms of its, like, it's in terms of its delivery, um, it's still very kind of gentle and kind of rolling as, as it kind of rolls in feels like a, a little bit like a storm on on on, on a beach really um, and then you get a lovely black pepper but then also that lovely citrusy um, uh, lemony kind of lemon balm that kind of yeah. comes through as well perhaps again a little bit um, of, of her maybe a little bit of sage just at the end or time just at the very very end as it, as it fades off as well and that little peppery kind of, of note as well that's stunning I, I love really, the sage note I love mm, the sage note I completely get that but it's um it does feel like you are on on an island um i i we have we have a fishmonger next door to us at the uh, the shop on chervale road and uh an oyster would be delicious with this right now <laughs> well that's that's our perfect pairing with it is that we've got atomizers that we spray and we, you know we fill with rock island we spray on oysters and, and take them with uh you know a bit of tabasco a bit of lemon juice and it, it works so well but the one thing that really surprised me is that we've got two perfect serves of this. Now, you you won't believe me with the first one, and I didn't believe the first time I heard it. A margarita. Now, if someone said to me, do you want a Scotch whiskey margarita? I'd be like, no thanks, I'll have a tequila <laughs> one. Mm -hmm. I urge anyone that's watching, please just try it. it. I didn't believe it. The first time someone said to me when I started with Douglas Lane, it's like, Rock Island works a margarita. I was like, rubbish. No, it doesn't. It works so well. If anyone's picking up on that kind of slight mezcal smoked note, mm -hmm. try Rock Island in a margarita. Classic margarita recipe, replace the tequila or the mezcal they're using with Rock Island. It works so, so well. I have tried this with a bunch of my friends who are mixologists in Glasgow, and they said the exact same thing to me, like, no, it doesn't. I was like, okay. Right, go for it. You make a classic margarita recipe, replace that, replace the tequila with the Rock Island. And I've gone away and they've texted me going, okay, you, you might be onto something. <laughs> so we, we work it into margarita and it works wonderfully. And the other perfect serve that we have is uh, Bloody Joseph, which is just a Scotch whiskey, Bloody Mary. And of course, any recipe, but you can imagine that salty maritime smokiness. Mm. It's just, it's wake up juice. It's great. It really, really works. And it's amazing to see that because if I said to you, oh, I've got a liquid here that's going to work in a margarita and a bloody mirror, like, no, you don't. That's awesome. <laughs> Genuinely works in both. And I would urge anyone that's watching to just try it, see how it works. I can I can see this working really well. Um, I'm I'm a great lover of margaritas and tequila and mezcal, and it had but with that salty, that kind of peppery note on there. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's going to be perfect with the triple sec in there, some lime juice as well. That's going to taste really, really good. But if you, um, yeah, if you just came to me blind and was like that in a margarita, you'd be like, no, know. You, you know, you're not going to look in a, a bar menu and go, Scotch whiskey and margarita, great. 
No, of mm-hmm. course you're not. But you know, if you, if you see a rock island margarita, it's like, oh, what's that? And it's mm. it's that whole way. And I think what we talked about earlier is that blind tasting concept, where it's just just try it. Does it taste good? Brilliant. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pushing people past this concept of blended. It's pushing people past this concept of oh, there's a cute little mouse and a dog in the front of it. So therefore, <laughs> it's not a serious whiskey. The reason that we do that is that we want to make Scotch whiskey as accessible as possible, mm-hmm. and it should be. That's Scotch whiskey is meant for everybody. And that's the whole point in it. But it's also, we, we take the liquid really seriously. We would never put anything out that we're not, not just proud of, that it's just that it's, it's taking it to a different level. That's what we're really happy with. And it's something I'm very proud of working with Douglas Lane is that, you know, sitting next to Fred and Karen and Chris in the office is that you get any samples and it's getting the opinion of, of people that, that, that want to give their opinion. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the, the company that we work for, the staff that we have, we're all consumers as well. We, we love we love taking these products and giving an opinion on it and, and shaping the, the eventual uh, SKUs and, and, and products that we sell. It's great. And I guess if you've got a, a company that's three generations of, of family and it has your, your family name on there, you're not going to be putting anything out that isn't 100% representative that you are proud uh, that you've worked on as well. So, exactly. you know, that you're, uh, as I said a little bit earlier with the, with the jazz quartet, there isn't anywhere to hide and you're, you're not going to put anything out that isn't going to be representative, that you're not going to be proud to have your, put your own family name on as well, especially no, when- exactly, Yeah, and, and, and any feedback that comes through, it doesn't just go to me, it doesn't just go to who, whoever was there at the time. You know, Fred will hear about it. You know, Fred, mm-hmm. Fred will hear about it, Carol will hear about it. Um, so any feedback that comes through, it's not as if it's filtering through you know, teams in different markets. There's 26, 27 of us total. We've wow. got two, two guys in Asia. Uh, we've got our, our global travel retail. Yes, we started a global travel retail at the start of 2020. That was, uh, <laughs> that was good fun. <laughs> um, but the rest of us all sit in the UK. Um, the vast majority of that, 90% of us sit in Glasgow. We've got uh, Dale, who's our European uh, sales. He's in Bristol. He's actually coming back on Monday uh, permanently. Um, Helen, who you do with Helen Barrett, mm-hmm. absolutely lovely human being. Uh, she's based down Leeds, so it's you know that that's the extent of it. We're we're all in in one in one big townhouse. And that's it. That's that's our office space. <laughs> the thing I, I really find um, uh, surprising a little bit about about um, uh, Rock Island as well, just because it's it's it's, a, it's an incredible whiskey, but it doesn't really taste like any other whiskey I've ever tasted. Um, and even with those distillery, the islands on which those distilleries lie, um, uh, the output of all of those do, doesn't really taste like this. So it's an exceptional, again, goes back to exceptional bit of blending to create uh, a character profile that has those individual notes in, uh, that creates a whiskey that's like, yeah, really tastes like this. And I think it's very uh, distinctive and very unique. Um, and yeah, there, there are very few other whiskies that I've, I've tasted in all my years of, of whiskey tasting, which is quite a lot, uh, that really match that kind of flavour profile of, of yeah. this particular particular dram, really. And I'd said to you earlier that um, I was going to tell you a story about Rock Island, but it's, it's, it's a really quick story, but it's, Rock Island is the most difficult one for us to create as a, or, or to be happy with. It's not necessarily about being create, you know, the creation, we've got the concept, but it's to be happy with because you, the, the islands are so dispersed in profile. You know, you go from Jura, let's, well, we can talk about Jura Distillery, Jura Distillery, Aaron, uh, mm-hmm. Talisker, um, you've got uh, Highland Park, Scapa, and um, we incorporate Isla in this. But all these distilleries have very different profiles. And what we're achieving with Rock Island is the, the encompassing of that, you know, that, that whole ultimate distillation of the islands. And the, because it costs, it, because it takes us so long to perfect this, it costs us the most in Ubers. So what I mean by that is a little 100 ml, I don't have any next to me, a little 100 ml sample takes an Uber from the vatting site to the office, gets sampled, no, not happy with that, back to the vatting site, back to the office, back to the vatting site. Um, so that costs us the most in Ubers. That is the, <laughs> the largest expense report in Ubers of all of the remarkable regional malts. Thankfully, not on my Uber account. But, um, that, is, that is a true story. It costs the most right. Ubers because of just this little 100 ml seat belt in the back seat of an Uber going back and forth from the vatting site to the headquarters and making sure that we're all happy with it. Wow. <laughs> Probably yeah. the most uh, the most chauffeured whiskey in history. Yeah. 
<laughs> Absolutely. This isn't getting in. It's like, oh, you John? Yeah, I'm John. Right, cool. Get in. <laughs> oh, fantastic. But um, yeah, that that's an, an incredible, very um, very different um, style of whiskey. Uh, yeah, I really, really love this, and I can't wait to try this out um, in a margarita. That's that's going to be happening after the stream. Going to be taking this home and uh, definitely trying. I love margaritas. But yeah, that's that's incredible. Um, and for me, it really does. You know, having spent some time on on that uh, west coast of Scotland, it encapsulates that environment really, really well. Um, again, you know, using those those single malts to paint a picture of of that, that landscape, um, and this really evokes it. Um, I could I could literally like you know, I said earlier, close my eyes and I feel like I'd be on on the on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and this would be a great dram to be actually be tasting in that environment. I think it would taste incredible. This is actually the first time I've ever gone back to the Epicurean just after Rock Island. Mm -hmm. I've never, I, I genuinely have never done it before. I normally wait till after Big Pete. I don't know if anyone else is going to see experience this, even if you're going to experience this, but it's marshmallow is the first thing I got on the nose with Epicurean, which is the last thing I expected the nose on it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Because after Big Pete, we talked about this before the live, before we went live, is that after Big Pete, you go back and it's pear drops and candy. And that's the reason I ask you to ask people to keep a little bit in it is to demonstrate that there's, there's flavors in this. But after Rock Island, I can't get past that that's toasted marshmallow. It really is. That's that's phenomenal. Um, yeah, that's and if you kept thing. if you kept um, a bit left over, that's yeah, that really does. And that's a that's a, an aroma that wasn't there when I smelled it at the beginning, and now that is there. So, um, but that's, that's the thing is that our nose and palates are now used to that high strength whiskey as well. So it's that's why I always think you know Epicurean. It's like oh, it's not as flavorful. It absolutely is, mm -hmm. but because it's the first one I'm tasting. Everyone just assumes that. That's why I always ask people to come taste it and go back to it and go, wow, that is very different to what my initial thoughts were. So we've uh, we've traveled through the lowlands, through the highlands, into Speyside, journeyed across uh, to the west of Scotland, to the islands. And I guess we're now finishing up uh, the whiskey island of Isla with Big Pete. We're finishing with Big Pete. Now, this has been drilled into me since I started with Douglas Lane. Big Pete is not a whiskey. He's a person. He exists. He's a family friend of Douglas Lane. He's a fisherman on Isla. Uh, he's the Bigfoot of Isla because no one's ever seen him, but he does exist. Mm -hmm. So Big Pete is our Isla blended malt. He's in, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in just a second because it, I, tru I truly think he is. He is the representation of Isla, but what we put into this is Ardbeg, Bowmore, Kalila, and original Port Ellen goes into every batch of Big Pete. Wow. Teaspoon. Mm -hmm. Teaspoon. But it does go into every single batch of Big Pete. And this was the one, or he was, sorry, not this, he was the one that started it all uh, back in 2009 from the Remarkable Regional Malt. Two words we use to describe Big Pete is sooty and ashy. Now, before anyone takes it onto the palate, because um, I know a lot of people just want to get to it. And if you already have, it's absolutely fine. But before you take it onto the palate, we'll go through this step by step because there's something I want you to really focus on when we before we take a, a sip of it. The nose. Now, the, the nose in Isla whiskeys, especially higher strength, this is 46%, especially higher strength Isla whiskeys, they have this deceiving nature where you know there's more to be unlocked within that liquid. You know there is. But it's, it's really balanced. I think the medicinal note pops through. There's a kind of sooty concept to it. Saltiness. Arguably some maritime. Some people may be picking that up more than others. But it's doesn't, you know, you, you see Big Pete and you assume, oh, it's just going to be really peaty. The nose, I don't think, kind of leads that in. Now, as we take this onto the palate, I want you to focus on the change that happens. So when we take this onto the palate, it'll be controlled chimney smoke and sweet citrus. I or I think I think it's quite close to kind of a lemon meringue pie and everything that comes with that. So you know the there's the vanilla meringue, you've got the baked and um, pastry bottom, but then all of a sudden the the chimney smoke, the logs spill out onto the cabin floor and burn down the house. It just becomes <laughs> it grows and it builds and builds and builds, becomes this wild bonfire smoke that you can't control, and then you exhale. And no good PT whiskey is ever finished without exhaling just smooth, sweet peat smoke. 
I've converted so many people into peaty whiskies because I think Big Peat is the ultimate distillation of Ireland. I'm not just saying that, I truly think it scratches that itch for anyone that wants a peaty whiskey. It takes the deep cuts of Laphroaig and Ardbeg and those phenols and all that peatiness and then balances it with Kalila, with that sweet lemon malt, and then takes into consideration your Ruklaris, your Bunhavans of the world that are very lightly, if not not peated at all. I think it's, I, I don't think you could argue for a better peated whiskey. I genuinely don't. And I'm not, I'm not just, I promise you, I'm not just saying that. I absolutely love it. But take a sip and you'll see this this build. And I, I absolutely, I, it's wonderful. Cheers. It's lunch. It just grows, grows. And it just, it continues to build and then you take that breath, your first, you know, breath in and breathe it out and it's just there. And it, it scratches every itch for any PT whiskey I've ever wanted. Wow. The, the age on this is about seven to eight years old. So it's mm -hmm. perfect. You know, it's, it's in that, that perfect five to 10 years old. If you want a PT whiskey, that's the best thing, best thing to drink a, a PT whiskey. And you get this very complex layers of flavor. You do get that, like you said, that sooty, that ash, that sort of like burnt timber kind of woody element that comes through there. But then also um, like that ashy bonfire, but then also like, like a bit of like roasted kind of meat, a little bit of bacon and yeah. uh, maybe char siu kind of like pork kind of sort of element as well. Yeah. It still has that that freshness and that maritime little nod of, of the of the rock island that little salty kind of element coming through there but without ever being overpowering and you do get those those layers and complexities that the um out, out of this particular dram that i think sometimes are missing out of other just single malts on their own from from that island um and again this this is i guess again this is the perfect analogy of, of like a, a jazz band these are all these little yeah. components all playing in at, at the same time um and you're getting essentially yeah like a best of isla this is like if you wanted one one whiskey that would encapsulate the whole of those those different distilleries on on the island then this is perfect for for that it is like a uh, it's like a best of but it's the balance that's really really good in here um with nothing really overpowering just everything kind of stepping and stepping and building and then and then releasing as well and the finish keeps on going on <laughs> it just yeah. carries on and on I've not taken another sip and it's still there. Mm. You're still breathing it out in every in every breath you take. But what I love is there's a sweetness to it. You know, a lot of mm. people taste this and they just kind of, oh, it's peaty. And they don't look past that. You know, it's there's a sweetness to it. You know, I'm salivating. There is a sweetness to it. I put this in whiskey sours. So it's just a smoky sour. You know, again, just mm. the whiskey classic sour recipe, throw this in and it just gives that extra kick to it. But the sweetness just works beautifully with it. Yeah, that little, lovely lemony kind of um, kind of element as well, which is which is the delicious. Um, and you say that there's there's a little teaspoon of of port Ellen in here. And for yep. some of our viewers who um, who might not have been to the island of Isla or, or, or who maybe visited, have just gone. I don't remember ever seeing a distillery called Port Ellen. Um, maybe you want to explain about why that's quite quite an important and quite a. Uh, uh, a surprising addition to this particular dram. So uh, Port Ellen is a now dead distillery, um, but has for a very long time been considered one of the, the best Isla distilleries that ever produced whiskey. And um, if you ask any big whiskey geek, they'll, they'll, they'll always say that Port Ellen was a, a god of the distillery. Now, I, I think the Azure are opening Port Ellen, but of course it's going to be a new distillery under the same name. And, um, of course, the stock will be slightly different. I'm so happy to see Port Ellen open up, but this was a uh, original Port Ellen. And if anyone's seen this, the cost of Port Ellen, it's just through the roof. Uh, Fred always talks about how if you knew the price of Port Ellen would go up so much, you wouldn't have put so much in this blended scotch that went around Southeast Asia. But um, I think we can, I think Fred's probably single handedly responsible for the price of Port Ellen going so up so much because he put so much in his blended scotch. Um, but we've got a, a great, I think it's top five in the world stock of Port Ellen, original Port Ellen, um, because it's been Fred, Cara, 
uh, in Chris's um, favourite distillery for a very long time. Even Fred talks about when his dad was tucking him in at night as a kid, he remembered him breathing the fumes of poor Ellen over him as he tucked him in. And it was just this, you know, it's that those wonderful memories that make Scotch whiskey Scotch whiskey. It you know, makes it such an endearing liquid. But Port Ellen is, is considered one of the best, but of course dead, it's been demolished completely. So the stock from Port Ellen Original is the stock that will ever exist of Port mm-hmm. Ellen Original. So it's only getting pricier by the minute. Mm-hmm. But we do put teaspoon Port Ellen into every single batch of Big Pete, which I think is still quite wonderful. Yeah. If if not economically, a little bit crazy. <laughs> a bit mental, but it's there. <laughs> not my decision to make. <laughs> well, again, this is the great thing about having a family, a family company run, run by a fam- family company is that, yeah, you can make those decisions. I'm sure the, um, uh, the accountants would be like, no, let's not do that. But this is the great thing about being a, an independent, um, that you can, you can do those, do those things. Um, yeah. and it's, yeah, probably the only chance that some of us will probably get to, to drink original port. Ellen is probably, uh, in, in this blend, yeah, I had a, I did a tasting with um, a whiskey group who are, are they, they buy up, you know, uh, auction casks, and we did a thirty-two year old Port Ellen, and it was, um, it's one of those ones where it's like the champagne of whiskey, but at the same time, it wasn't the favourite of everyone's on the on the tasting, and that's what makes whiskey wonderful is that, you know, age and all this jazz, it, it doesn't necessarily matter to individuals. If mm-hmm. you love a cheap whiskey, great. If you love an expensive whiskey. Very unfortunate because you're going to have to buy that every time you want your favorite whiskey. So it's very subjective. You enjoy what you enjoy and do not tell, do not let anyone else tell you what you like. That's absolutely rubbish. I just went back to the Epicurean there. And again, it's changed from the Rock Island all of a sudden, as, as I expected with the big Pete. And what I love to demonstrate is this pear drop candy sweetness, like burnt white sugar sweetness. That marshmallow nose has gone completely. Like it, yeah. it's gone for me. Yeah, incredible, a- absolutely gone. It's got almost like a um, a lemon sorbet thing going on with it as yeah. well. You know what I got from it, which is really I don't think this is a really bizarre note because I've never actually smelt it. Is a, a candied basil leaf, and that's never smelt that in my life, ever in my life. <laughs> I'm just putting together what candied and a basil leaf smells like. But what what's great is that the five whiskies that we've tasted. All of them are water, yeast, and barley, aged in oak. That's it. And we've had five completely different tasting whiskies. All of them have their own characters. They have their own tasting notes. They're all complex and have that depth, but not one is like the other. And that, that's, you know, whiskey is the, Scotch whiskey specifically, is the most complex spirit in the world. It genuinely is. And I, and I think the Remarkable Region Malls are a great testament to that. They are there. It's, it's been a, an amazing tour of Scotland and really representative of all the uh, all the different areas. And I think they also, you know, not only represent the, the, the areas and those distilleries really well, but all, also geographically, I think they really transport you to the uh, those actual places in Scotland. And we kind of like have done uh, a geographical tour, but also through through liquid as well. From like the uh, the the lowlands with the Epicurean, which gives you that like light, light fresh, and going back to it again, like more complex than you originally assume it was going to be with with uh, when you first drink it. But that that kind of herbaceous, sagey, thyme kind of elements, that that rolling kind of like lovely lush kind of uh, uh, grass grassiness as well, uh, up into the highlands with with Tamora Speisty. Um, and then you get that lovely sort of heathery, honey kind of note as well. Uh, kind of I represents that again. It's like toffee. Have you noticed mm. the timorous beastie again? If you've got, if you if you can, it's just it's toffee. It's, if anyone's ever had you know, the toffee fees that get mm-hmm. advertised readily on TV, it's just toffee. And again, that, that's again, it's going in that contrast. It's just pure, not just burnt sugar, but real cream caramel toffee and tablet almost. Sorry, I interrupted you there, Jeff. I just mm. over it. No, no. I mean, that's the great thing as well. You like keep on going back to all these different whiskies, and especially because the you know in in these serves that the fifty FC, um, fifty mils, you can keep going back and trying them and seeing how they change yeah. and how they evolve in the glass. 
Um, and again, I think that's testament to the, the great blending and the skills and the fact that these are our blended molds, that we fact that we have all these different elements that we can play with to create this very complex and structured and, and very nuanced sort of styles that just will keep changing and evolving in, in the glass as well. Uh, but the Tamura Speedsy, yeah, it's stunning. Um, and quite indicative, I think, of, of, the, the, of the Scottish Highlands. A little bit more rugged than the Epicurean, but fuller and kind of richer. Um, and then we went to the Scallywag, the space side. Um, so we're going, going from, I guess, more bourbon kind of casks in, in here, that fresh yeah, sort of style. Yeah, 100% so, bourbon. So the, um, uh, the richer uh, 75 80% uh, Oloroso with the, uh, with the Scallywag here. Um, again, giving you those really fruity, stewed Christmas cake kind of textures as well. That uh, if you had it without the water to begin with, um, like, like the uncooked Christmas pudding, and then then with the water it really opens it up and gives you those those incredible incredible fruits. Uh, and again, really representative of the, of the uh, as you descend from the hills into space side and that really fertile uh, kind of plain. Greatest concentrations of distillery in, in space side there. And then our little journey across to, to Rock Island um, and the, the maritime kind of notes are very much unlike uh, uh, any other whiskey I've, I've really had, but you really could picture standing on the uh, on the shoreline, that kind of like that smoke and that light smoke, that sea breeze, the iodine, the salt and the pepper really coming through. And then finally finishing up on this, the Big Pete as well, um, essentially like a, a best of the, of the island of Isla. Um, and then huge complexity in, in this whiskey. Um, you know, the names suggest like, like it's going to be uh, like a, a, just a one trick pony, like one, one thing. But, you know, Big Pete, he, Big Pete himself, he's a complex character. You know, you can't always. He's such a good looking guy as well, isn't he? He is. There you go. Look at him. Um, uh, but yeah, really uh, rounds up the um, the island of Isla as well. And uh, you know, like like uh, any any human being, he's got lots of facets. He's got lots of moods that uh, we, we can uh, pull out as well. Yeah, fantastic, a fantastic tour um, through the remarkable malts collection. Hopefully, um, if you've you know if you're new to whiskey, if you've discovered um, these these regions, you'll be able to find out maybe some other favorites from from these particular ones so maybe the space side was yours and that'll give you a nice little jumping point to go view and go see other whiskies from from that that area and also maybe explore you know the if the rock island was your favorite maybe explore the the series from those, those characteristics yeah. as well um, but the great thing about about Dr. Slang and, and the company is, is that that's not the only thing that you do, do you? So you, you've got the uh, experiments with like the Epicurean and different sort of casks. Uh, there are the older age statements. So we have like some older Rock Island where like the 18 years old yeah. as well. I've got the, I keep, it, because the camera's reversed, I keep pointing the wrong shoulder. <laughs> yeah. This is the, the Rock Island 10, for example. I've got the sherry mm -hmm. cask through there. We did a, the, the most, one of the most recent bottlings I've got with me and I filmed, I, myself and the CFO fell in love with it, was our Timber Beastie Meet the Beast. This was a cask strength version, predominantly first fill at 54.9%. If anyone's ever tasted Aberlour Abuna, which is a, a sherry bomb, this is a mm -hmm. bourbon bomb. It's just <laughs> vanilla cream at its most intense. It's just an the thing is it's just an amplification of the, the core that we've just tasted. And um, the one thing that you'd said there, Jeff, I, I completely agree with is the Marcovita the malt serve not just the purpose as like sipping whiskies and mixing whiskies. Is my my friend is a he's realised that I can get him free whiskey. That's what he's realised. <laughs> so he's like, well, you know what? I'm going to start exploring whiskey a bit more. And I sent him down one of the mini packs that we've, we've used for tonight's tasting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I was like, he was like, what you know? What should I try next? I was like, right, try all these which one did you like which one did you not like and I, I sat and did a tasting much like this whip and he said oh you know i love scallywack like, great so i gave him a list of distilleries and you know bottlings that i think he would like and he's since bought them and he's like i love these they're great and i'm so happy that we did this because he would have just been buying bottles willy-nilly and going you know i've spent x amount here and x amount here and i didn't quite understand what i was doing so i completely agree with you the remarkable results you know we do our wild and wonderful stuff and our single cast stuff but they do serve a core purpose, which is representing the traditional flavours of Scotch whisky in each region of Scotland. So anyone that tries them, they can go, right, I like this. That's my frame of reference. What else can I you know, delve into within this concept of, of whisky? And, and it's, it's great. It just helps, it helps a lot of people get into Scotch whisky and also help them explore it as well. It's nice to see. Fantastic. 
Well, um, yeah, Stuart, thank you. Thank you for this evening and uh, taking us through all these uh, incredible, this incredible journey, this incredible tour of Scotland and Very all good. of its kind of facets and all of its different flavours. I hope if you've been watching uh, for live on the stream tonight or if you're watching this on, on Catch Up, um, you've found some favourite whiskies there for yourself as well. You've had a, a, a really interesting tour and all of these whiskies that have been here uh, very, very different uh, and very quite unique sort of flavours as well. Um, hopefully this, if you're new to whisky, this will get you into, um, as we've just been talking about, discovering new uh, flavours and new distilleries that you'd be really into. But also the uh, the work of the uh, Douglas Lang and we at the shop here carry a lot of their, their different ranges. We carry their, their single casks as well. Um, as we spoke about, like the one, the, like the, the drum solo or the, the, the solo player in, in the quartet and where you can actually really drill down and, and find those unique characteristics uh, of, of those whiskies. And also some of the new bits and pieces that they've done as well. So we've just had these uh, lovely looking amazing whiskies in, which are the double barrels. Um, and just quickly before we sign off this evening, Stuart, tell us a little bit about, about these. Oh, it's not even quick. I don't think I can do this. <laughs> so we, we were talking this before the live. So Double Barrel um, has been it's been on our portfolio for a long time, but we've just gone through a rebrand of them that, um, that you've got there, Jeff, and I think they're absolutely stunning. And if Jeff, you can hold them up, you'll see yeah. the, the the concept of duality. If you twist what, just one of them, um, we've got a mermaid in the bottle here, where it's the whole concept is duality. Now we talked, but these are blended malts that we have in front of us. Double Barrel is technically blended malt but we're only using two casks. So it's only ever two casks that we use, one from one distillery, one from another. I swear that when Fred decided to do this, he just wants to make things as complicated as possible because you might think that's really easy, but it's not a case of just like dumping two casks together and hoping for the best. It is tweaking them to within an inch of their life to make sure that it's balanced, that it's worth drinking and it's good quality. I would argue just Blending two casts together is one of the most difficult things you can ask any any blender across the world to do. Is one of the most difficult things, and it's just been it, it's it's barely even you know single malt is mul blending multiple casts from one distillery. This is two casks. It's as close to getting to single cask as you can get. It's technically blended malt, but it's arguably not. It's almost like a completely different category of Scotch whiskey. Um, it, it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful testament to the art of blending scotch whiskey um, and i think we were discussing potentially doing something with them which i'm not going to raise anyone hopes or anything but uh, be more than happy to jump on and do that which uh, yeah it's been great yeah. to taste them and try all of them so yeah hopefully uh, we'll be getting to uh, taste these another little micro tasting and hopefully yeah Stuart, you'll come and talk to us about those at some point in the future so um uh, if you're watching the stream uh hopefully keep keep checking out with us on our website uh, on the youtube channel um and hopefully we'll have that and maybe at some point in the next month or so where you get to have a little taste of those and we can talk about the art of the blending and how how uh, really really tricky it is to actually actually do that um the best thing to do if you want to keep uh, informed is because we're on youtube you can subscribe to our, our channel so just hit that little subscribe button um uh, and uh, if you like the video just press the, the like button as well uh, subscribing just means that you'll get informed of all the all the tastings that we we have and when they're coming up so uh, uh yeah just hit that button uh it just leads me to say Thank you, Stuart. I really, really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for taking the time out the, this evening um, to come uh, show us the, these incredible whiskies. Um, and if you're really into into those, like I say, the stepping point into your world of whiskey exploration, uh, but also, um, yeah, come check out all the other work from, from Douglas Lang, from the double barrels and the single casks and some of the XOPs that we have here as well. Um, so, yeah, just to say thank you very much for watching the stream and we'll see you. Thanks to Stuart. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.